It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Isn't it the case that in April 2003, a confidential government directive was issued which confirmed that maintaining bulk billing was no longer an objective of the government and ordered that government documents should, in future, no longer contain any reference to the words bulk billing? Order. I, Member Jagger Jagger has the call. I quote from that directive. We have moved away from discussion of bulk billing, and words not to be included in the lexicon include bulk billing. Prime Minister, isn't it the case that the government is so committed to getting rid of bulk billing for Australian families that it wants to strike the words bulk billing out of the government's vocabulary? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware of any such directive. Order. Leader I'm of the not opposition, a, I'm not aware uh, at all of any such Wills, directive. The Mr. Prime Minister has the call. I'm not aware of any such directive, but let me uh, take the opportunity of reminding uh, the member for Jagger Jagger of the elements uh, of uh, Medicare as uh, expounded by Dr. Blewett, the health minister who was responsible for Medicare's introduction. And uh, he never at any stage said that the guaranteed bulk billing was part of Medicare. Oh. for Boothby. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Would the Prime Minister inform the House how a free trade agreement with the United States would create jobs and economic growth in Australia? What has been the level of support from the community and the business sector? Prime Minister. Speaker, I, uh, I thank the member for Boothby uh, for the his question. For and I take the opportunity of reminding the House that when I met President Bush in the United States last month, we both agreed to conclude the negotiation towards a free trade agreement between Australia and the United States um, by the end of this year. That is a very ambitious uh, timetable, but it does reflect the very strong commitment of both the Australian government and the Bush administration towards concluding such an agreement. A high-quality free trade agreement between Australia and the world's largest and strongest economy will be of unqualified benefit to this country in the years ahead. And I was reminded of just how valuable a free trade agreement would be when I read yesterday um, a paper prepared by Stephen Rapes, the chief economist of the uh, New York-based uh, bank Morgan Stanley, uh, when he made the point that since 1995, the world has had only one engine of economic growth, and that has been the United States, one real engine of economic growth. And he pointed out that over the seven-year period ending in 2001, the US economy accounted for fully 63 per cent of the cumulative increase in world GDP. And over that period of time, Europe, the European Union, a region of comparable size to that of the United States accounted for only 8 per cent of the increase in world GDP over that period of time. Mr. Speaker, so, so over that period of time you have 63 per cent of the growth in world GDP is accounted for by the United States. Europe, by contrast, is only 8 per cent, yet it's of comparable size. And this is the market, this is the opportunity that apparently the Federal Labor Party would deny Australia, Mr Speaker, because it's the policy of the Federal Labor Party, uh, as uh, articulated by the member for Rankin, uh, not to uh, sign a free trade agreement with the United States, Mr Speaker. I can't think of anything more calculated to deny this country an opportunity of being part of the fastest growing economic um, entity in the world, the one that more rather than less will bulk large in the future of this country, Mr Speaker. And, of course, what the member for uh, Rankin is saying um, is uh, in stark contrast to what some successful Labor people in Australia are saying, Mr Speaker. For example, the Premier of New South Wales, Mr Speaker, said it is in Australia's interest to link ourselves with the world's most dynamic and creative economy. The Premier of South Australia said an FTA would give us access to 280 million customers. The Premier of Victoria recognises potential benefits for the Victorian economy through increased access to markets and improved investment flows. 
And the Premier of Queensland, Mr Speaker, said that an FTA could be the most momentous boost for our primary industries in 100 years, Mr Speaker. Now that is, they are the words, they are the words of successful Labor leaders, Mr Speaker. By contrast, those who represent the Australian Labor Party in this place are so ignorant of and indifferent to the opportunities for the Australian economy that they set their face against this opportunity. Mr Speaker, for the government's part, we will continue to negotiate to achieve a free trade agreement. And if we can achieve it on proper terms, Mr Speaker, it will Rankin. do more than any other single act to underwrite the economic future and the economic security of this nation well into the 21st century. Yeah. Member for Jagger, Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is again to the Prime Minister. Didn't the government's confidential April 2003 directive which confirmed that maintaining bulk billing was no longer an objective of the, of the government and ordered that the words bulk billing be deleted from the government's vocabulary, include the instruction, and I quote, please review all our question time briefs for these offending words, <laughs> monitor this strictly and ensure that nothing slips through. Why is the government so offended by bulk billing that it has ordered that the words bulk billing be removed from its vocabulary. Prime Minister, isn't it the case that the government wants to strike the words bulk billing from its vocabulary because it wants to put an end to bulk billing for Australian families? Member for Sydney, Member for Rankin. Prime Minister has the call. Evidently, can I say to the Member for Jagger Jagger, self evidently, uh, the use of the words uh, bulk billing uh, is not offensive to the government because those words were used in the new policy of Fair and Medicare, which was released after the date of that alleged instruction. Member for Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is addressed to the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Has the Minister had any further information on any representations made to him following a lunch at Brighton Le Sands? The Minister for Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr Speaker, after this issue was raised yesterday, I said I would follow it up. Uh, as I advised the House yesterday, my 60th birthday was in March this year. Um, you're obviously the Minister not listening has the carefully, call. are you? Um, Order. The Minister has the call. I have no doubt it would be facilitated if members were silent. I will listen for the Minister. If I cannot hear him, I will instruct the radio monitors to do something about it. The Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I did attend a function at the Rumal restaurant at Brighton Le Sands on the 14th of April 2003. It was arranged as a surprise but belated birthday celebration, and as I said yesterday, not by Mr Kizawani. In attendance, as I recall, there were approximately 100 people, uh, a former Premier, three bishops, community leaders, Consul General, um, and a, a large number, I believe, of both Liberal and Labor supporters. Um, the, organiser, the organisers of the function made it clear that there were no immigration issues to be raised. Again, as I advised the House yesterday, I do not recall any immigration cases being raised with me at the function. My officers confirmed that no matters were brought to it following the function. As with the other matters that the opposition has raised over the last three weeks, their assertions have been sadly astray. Um, further, Mr Speaker, I did not instruct any member of my staff to attend a follow-up meeting, nor was there any such meeting involving my staff a week later in the meeting hall of Order. the Lebanese Christian community in Punchbowl. Um, I know of nobody known as the Lebanese Christian community. Uh, I do know that the Australian Lebanese Christian Federation is located at Punchbowl. This federation is a community settlement service scheme funded body funded by the department to offer settlement services to the Arabic speaking community. For completeness, Mr Speaker, I should advise the House that I do have representations from the Australian Lebanese Christian Federation and from time to time they are in touch with my office as are representatives of most other like bodies. On one occasion, uh, departmental liaison officers from my office have visited the premises of the Federation, and that was on the 18th of February 2003. Uh, two months 
uh, before the birthday function. In discussions with Federation representatives on that day, some eight immigration matters were raised with departmental officers. Four related to my intervention powers, one of which I have declined to intervene, uh, and three are currently under consideration, um, and none, as have been alleged, in relation, I think it was, to 25, have been acceded to by me. The other matters were various immigration cases being processed routinely by my department against standard legislative criteria. While it is clear that that meeting had nothing to do with the function in April, I think it was important to reiterate uh, what I advised the House yesterday. It would not be unusual for me to ask my office in relation to matters that have been raised with me to follow up those matters uh, with those who make inquiries. It would not be unusual nor unexpected. Um, I think anybody dealing with me or my office would expect uh, that inquiries would be properly dealt with by departmental liaison officers in the office. To do otherwise would be an abrogation of my responsibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services and Leader of the National Party. Can the Deputy Prime Minister confirm that the Leader of the National Party in Queensland, Mr Lawrence Springborg, has adopted Labor's policy not to sell the rest of Telstra? Will the Deputy Prime Minister now join his Queensland National Party colleague in adopting Labor's policy of saving Telstra? The Deputy Prime Minister, in his capacity as Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition in Queensland would in no way adopt the Labor Party's policy on Telstra, which is to completely and absolutely ignore bush services yeah. based on their historical performance. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. They'd be far more interested in closing down things like uh, mobile services than they ever would be in ensuring that country people had a fair go. Well, the yeah. Honourable Member for Hinkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of measures the government is implementing to ensure that telecommunications services to regional Australia are future proofed? so they will continue to be improved. Member for Brisbane. Is the, Deputy Pro is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any alternative policies? The Deputy Prime Minister in his capacity as Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Hinkley for his question. And as he and uh, his and other constituents around rural Australia would know, no one has fought harder and fights harder than him for the government's objectives of ensuring that country people have access to the telecommunication services that they need and that they have them in the future, because that's what we're determined to do. And Mr Speaker, uh, securing the future of regional telecommunications comes in three parts. First, we'll spend $140 million, which is quite a bit of money, on a national broadband strategy to both provide affordable access to broadband and to stimulate the take-up of broadband. Second, we'll impose a licence condition on Telstra that it both maintain a local presence in regional Australia uh, and it will lay down parameters that Telstra has to fulfil to meet that requirement. Mr. Speaker, tough condition. Member for Macmillan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this will be in addition to the licence conditions and other requirements already imposed by the government on Telstra and on other suppliers. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the adequacy of telecommunication services will be under continuing review. The Besley and Eston's inquiries are not the end, Mr. Speaker, of the government's surveillance of regional telecommunications. They're the beginning, because we will include in legislation the requirement for ongoing, regular and independent reviews of regional telecommunications Member and Bratton. especially whether important new services are being delivered equitably in these areas. So, Mr Speaker, these reviews will not only have to be tabled in the parliament, uh, this government and future governments, unless they are going to say they don't believe in future proofing and they are going to walk away from it, they are going to go back to where they were before and never monitor and never move to insist on an improvement in bush services. Unless they are going to do that and unwind our commitments, Mr. The Speaker, for future governments will be obliged to respond publicly to the findings of those reviews. So, Mr. Speaker, under, under this government's plan, Telstra can't walk away Member from regional Australia because if it tried to, it, lose its, it would lose its licence to operate in the cities as well. That's what had happened. And under the government's plan, no government will be able to simply forget 
about regional telecommunications, as Labor did for so long, because if they try, their abrogation will be publicly exposed and they'll be obliged to address it. So, Mr Speaker, that's how you secure the future of regional telecommunications. First, you close the gap in services. Then you legislate and regulate so the gaps can't reopen. And finally, and very importantly, Mr Speaker, you foster competition to drive down the price and drive up service uh, variety. Mr Speaker, it's interesting to note that uh, thousands of school children in remote New South Wales and, for uh, Melbourne. and the Northern Territory are doing their schooling at home, the School of the Air children, and they're getting used to their new computerised real-time classroom. They've traded in their 50-year-old two-way radios for the latest two-way satellite technology. And, uh, Mr Speaker, in western New South Wales, in Narromine, Burke, Cobar, Gulgong, Lightning Ridge, Ningan, Trangi and Warren, people are getting used to their new GSM mobile phone services. But do you know what, Mr Speaker? Telstra didn't provide them. Optus did. Optus did. Competition out there because there's a bob to be made, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. an opportunity to be exploited, and that produces good outcomes in regional Australia, not because the government so forced them to, but because there was an opportunity there to be met, Mr Speaker. And that's a very important point. Are there any alternative policies, I'm, uh, I'm asked? Well, I tell you what, there certainly aren't any that would encourage rural people to vote for Labor when it comes to telecommunication standards. All we hear is the repetition of a mantra, never explained, never explained, why it is it that they never explain how government ownership of Telstra will guarantee services? Because they know the claim can't be justified, Mr Speaker. It doesn't stand up. The fact is that governments have the power to ensure service outcomes. And this idea that the poor little federal government would be frightened by a telco that I hear from the opposite number, what do they think the federal government is? They know full well. And the opposition spokesman for telecommunications well, for acknowledged in, on radio in Melbourne the, the other day, old chap. You acknowledge Wills. the government has the power and you know it has the power. So let's have some integrity in this debate and let's have the debate. Member for Marino. Member for Melbourne on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I'd request that you draw the Minister's attention to the continuous use of the word you. No, member, no, no, the member for Melbourne will resume his seat. Member for Melbourne will resume his seat. <laughs> member for Melbourne has raised a point of order and not as yet given me an opportunity to respond to it or the courtesy of listening to my response. Member for Lowe, resume your seat. I point out to the member for Melbourne. I would point out to the member for Melbourne, who raised a point of order but apparently didn't want to hear a response to it. I would point out to the member for Melbourne that the use of the word "you" is outside the standing orders, where the statement is directed individually to someone in the house. In fact, to, it's not, I was listening to what the minister said. In every occasion where he said you, it wasn't something that, at, about which the speaker could have intervened because it wasn't directed individually to someone else in the House. I'm happy to elaborate on this with the member for Melbourne later. <laughs> member for Lowe. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to the government's plan to narrow the diversity of media ownership and opinion in Australia. Is the Prime Minister aware of the comments of the member for Calair of his time at Channel 9 that, and I quote, Kerry Packer exerted a direct and at times hands-on influence on the content of news bulletins, particularly at politically sensitive times, and a direct influence over editorial policy, unquote. Prime Minister, how can newsrooms be separated from their owners, given the experience of the member for Kalea and the uniform editorial position taken by the Murdoch group Order. in relation member to Lowe. the war member in Iraq? Member for Lowe, resume his seat. The member for McKellar on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the standing, the standing orders clearly set out that in a question you may not use material which constitutes argument uh, and debate, and that, that, 
That uh, uh, information which was inserted into that question is certainly by way of conjecture, argument and debate and should be ruled out of order. Member for Hunter. The member for Lowe has questioned on meaning or ownership, and I'm listening closely to the content. The member for McKellar is right that there was a level of argument in the question, as there often is. I have allowed him to continue, but ask him to come to the question. Prime Minister, how can newsrooms be separated from their owners, given the experience of the member for Kalia and the uniform editorial position taken by the Murdoch Group in relation to the war in Iraq? Prime Minister, will the government now abandon its plan to hand more power to the big media groups? Narrowing the base of democratic opinion and debate member in Australia. For, member for Lower Regime. Well, this is central. Member for McKellar will resume her seat. When, when the House has come to order, the member for Lowe is well aware of the fact that his actions in the latter part of the question were grossly disorderly. The member for McKellar was seeking the call when I asked. I'm going to make the point that, in fact, the uh, member asking the question was flouting your ruling and introducing the material which you'd no, already I, said was disorderly. I, I had I interrupted. I think the matter has been satisfactorily dealt with, but I will hear the member for McKellar. Mr. Speaker, I draw your attention I to your the ruling. Member for Werra, the manager of opposition business. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I draw your attention to your ruling on the 12th of December last year, when you said that I believe every member's word should be taken as their bond. It's hardly conjecture from the member for Clare. We the should member take for his word resume his seat. The member for Werra, resume his seat. This question time is not being assisted. I have allowed the question to stand. I merely required the member for member Minister for Foreign Affairs. I merely required the member for Lowe, as he understood, to take action on what was an unparliamentary statement and act at the end of his question. The minute, Prime Minister. Speaker, uh, to start with, in reply to the member for Lowe, I reject completely the depiction of the government's uh, media legislation contained in the first part of the question. As to the second part of the question, I'm not aware of the remarks of the member for Kalea. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, thirdly, can I just generally say that I have, uh, since it was introduced, uh, regarded uh, the present media laws uh, as being uh, ill-conceived. Uh, they were designed uh, largely to uh, smash the power of the then Melbourne Herald Group because it was seen as unsympathetic to the former government and uh, also I think it was directed to uh, reduce a lot of the power uh, uh, of the then uh, uh, Macquarie uh, Network and Fairfax Group which of course was far extensive in the 1980s and it is now. I think the legislation was conceived on the basis of blind hostility of the then Treasurer uh, to the attitude of newspapers and it will become somebody who, who comes from the same kidney of the Australian Labor Party as that particular individual uh, to, uh, to, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, to be accusing the government of some kind of attitude towards Order. media member, proprietors. The member for Wills. Member for Herbert, resume his seat. The member for Lowe. Mr. The member for Lowe has the call. No. He must have a point of order. No, Mr. Speaker, in view of the Prime Minister's response, I seek no, leave to table uh, the member for Calais' uh, second reading speech on the Broadcasting Services Amendment mm -hmm. Media Ownership Bill 2000 order. on the 26th of September order. last member year. Because member, it's for Lowe. Here. member for Lowe. The member for Lowe will resume his seat. The member for Lowe knows perfectly well. In fact, the member for Lowe knows perfectly well that he can only raise what is a point of order. He has sought to table a document, and I will facilitate that. But any other comment would be out of order, as he must be well aware. The member, the member for Lowe resume his seat. My advice would be to quit while he's in front. But may, 
The member order. The member for Lowe has sought the un has sought to table a speech in the hand side. It is an unusual package. But since it's already available, member for Lowe. The member for, member for Herbert. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer inform the House of the Government's approach to keeping taxes low? And Treasurer, Treasurer, are you aware of alternate views on levels of taxation? Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member uh, for his question, and uh, I can tell him, as the government announced in its budget, that I warn uh, the member for after Ballarat. funding our commitments in Iraq, after funding uh, investment in higher education and in health, after making assistance for those that are affected by drought, the government is able and will, from Tuesday of next week, reduce income tax for every Australian income tax payer. Now, as uh, we've watched the states bring down their budgets since, we have seen eight state Labor governments increase taxes. Between them, we've seen a new levy on electricity bills in Queensland, a new levy on water bills in South Australia, a new levy on insurance in Western Australia. In Victoria, we saw 300 fees and taxes increased and tolls on the Scoresby Freeway. And we've watched, Mr Speaker, the Federal Labor Party sit silently through all of this, turn their backs and try and pretend they don't even know it's happening, Mr Speaker. Have we heard, have we heard for the Blackstone. member for Hotham on the subject of tolls on the Scoresby Freeway? If he ever goes out to the electorate of Hotham, he will find that nearby is a road reserved to go from Ringwood down to Frankston. He himself launched Labor's policy during the last election for a freeway. And now the Brax government has turned it into a tollway. Have we heard a whimper or a complaint? Now, we're coming to the last day of this uh, budget session. And, Mr Speaker, uh, I could have sworn uh, when, uh, when the Labor Party uh, was putting its rhetoric uh, out that uh, somehow it was going to stand for lower taxation. I could have sworn that two months ago. In fact, uh, we, we even had statements uh, to that effect. And I wondered, after the eight state Labor governments had increased taxes, what the commitment of federal Labor was to lower taxes. And, Mr Speaker, uh, I decided I'd go back to the Australian Candidate Study 2001 which is a confidential questionnaire of all of the candidates that took place in the 2001 election. Member for Wills. And they are asked this question, this is on the public record, uh, C3 question. Uh, uh, it said it is confidential. It just uh, aggregates it aggregates it aggregates the outcome. It doesn't actually have the names. It doesn't actually have Treasurer the Treasurer will address his remarks through the chair. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, when candidates were asked whether they supported mildly or strongly reducing taxes amongst Liberal and National Party, 65 per cent said they were in favour of mildly or strongly reducing taxes. The member for Werriwa. Right on cue, the member for Werriwa comes member in. Member for Bass. When the Australian Labor Party candidates were asked whether they were mildly or strongly in favour of reducing taxes, you know the percentage that were in favour? Three per cent. Three per cent of the Labor candidates in 2001 were mildly or strongly in favour of reducing taxes. Now, Mr Speaker, we, 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 we have, done, we have done an analysis. Sitting on the other side of the House, Mr Speaker, are 64 Labor members, 3 per cent of whom are in favour of lower taxes, which means there are two Labor members sitting opposite who are in favour of lower taxes. 
Order. Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Treasurer. Treasurer. Mr. Speaker, the they have two members order. in favour of lower. They may have three roosters, but two members in favour of lower taxes. Now, I am going to start a competition to try and identify the dirty secret of those two members. Which of you are there that supports lower Treasurer. taxes, Mr. Speaker? Two. No wonder the Labor Party has gone quiet on lower taxes. The the same question had something like. 17 per cent of Labor members mildly supported spending more and 68 per cent strongly supported bigger government spending, a return rate of 85 per cent. So, Mr Speaker, don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do, Mr Speaker. Labor is and always has been the party of higher tax, and we conclude this session by outing the fact that 97 per cent of those sitting on the other side would like government taxes to go higher, not lower. Member for Reid. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Member for Reid. Member for Reid. Member for Reid, resume his seat. The the member for Reid has the call. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Immigration. Isn't it the case that in the last three weeks the minister has been able to conduct analysis on the number of representations made on behalf of East Timorese from different sides of politics, including correcting his statement within 24 hours? the number of first-time requests and repeat requests he has received under various sections of the Migration Act, interventions he has made on groups on the basis of country of origin, such as Fijians, and the 62 representations, including 25 that he agreed to consider intervening on that I have made. Given this track record and proven ability to check the record, why won't the minister inform Australians about how many immigration matters Mr Karim Kizawani has made representations to the Minister about. And his <coughs> Member Reid will resume his seat. I have already demanded silence and it will be respected by the Member for Wills. Member for McKellar on a point of order. 146 says that a question fully answered may not be renewed. You have on many occasions, as has your predecessors, ruled that you may not tell the minister how he or she may answer that question. And whichever way the minister chooses to answer a question is a full answer. I would put it to you, Mr Speaker, that this question has been put to the minister again and again and again, and it is clearly in breach of Standing Order 146, which says he has fully answered the question in the way the minister chooses to do so. Member for the member for Wirra, we'll leave manager of opposition business. On the point of order, Mr. Speaker, uh, two points. The first is that the member for Reid hasn't finished his question, and it's uh, obviously impossible to assess uh, the matters raised by the member for the McKellar. member for Blair is and warned. My second point is that uh, in the questions referred to by the member for McKellar, no mention was made about representations on behalf of the East Timorese the number of first-time requests and repeat requests under various sections of the Migration Act, interventions on the basis of country of origin such as the Fijians, and the 62 representations, including 25 where the minister intervened, made uh, by the member for Reid. So this is a totally different question, Mr Speaker, to the ones referred to by the member for McKellar. Oh. Member. Order. The member for Brisbane consistent with the member for Blair is warned.
Member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I didn't rise to uh, raise the point of order on any of the matters that were raised by the member opposite. I chose to uh, invoke the standing order and draw it to your attention when again the question relating to the particular individual uh, and of the number of um, visas that were purporting to relate to his intervention was raised. That is the question that has been raised again and again in this House, not the ones that were raised in the point of order by uh, the member opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there are valid points of order on both sides of the House. The member for McKellar is right to observe that the questions about Mr Kizawani have been extensively canvassed. The member for Reid is also right to say that other points of his question had not been directly responded to. The member for Reid had not had an opportunity to finish his question and it would be improper for me to rule it out of order until he had done so. The member for Reid. Just uh, read that last paragraph again for the minister. Given this track record and proven ability to check the record, why won't the minister inform Australians about the many immigration about how many sorry immigration matters Mr Karim Kizawani has made representations to the minister and his office about and in what percentage of those cases the minister granted a visa if cost is a consideration does this indicate a high level of intervention requests <laughs> member for McKellar Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having heard the completion of the question, I would simply say to you again that section 146 does say that that last part of that, that question, in fact, has been asked again and again. The and member the for Rankin has, is warned. The minister has indeed answered it fully, and as you have ruled before, you may not tell the minister how he may answer it, but he has clearly answered before. I will I invite the member for Reid to resume his seat. I invite the member for Fisher to resume his seat. I recognise points of order if, they, if there is a matter still to raise them, but as the occupier of the chair, I believe the question can stand because there are parts of the question that have not previously been um, canvassed, and I will allow it to stand for that reason. If the member for Fisher has a point of order, or the member for Reid, I will of course hear him. Member for Fisher. Point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it relates to Standing Order 85, irrelevance or tedious repetition. And the member for Reid is seriously and serially guilty of that, and I would ask that you rule his question out of order on the basis of Standing Order 85. Neither the clerk nor I can concede that that is a valid point of order. The question stands, Mr. Member for Reid, the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I made it very clear yesterday that, uh, in relation to the information I've provided the House before in relation to representations made to me, it was indicative and not exhaustive. In other words, I don't know, having searched every file of the 27,000 where representations have been made, that the member for Reid has not been involved in it. Order. No, it was indicative. The minister uh, has the indicative. Call. And, um, and, and the fact is, the fact is, when I'm asked a question, Order. when I'm well, um, we might be able to give call. indicative information. But the, if you ask me a question which asks precisely. Minister for the number of occasions in which Mr Kisawani has made representations to me or my office, it requires an examination of 27,000 27, 27, uh, files in order Member to be able to provide Bert. that information. And what I said was very clear. I am not prepared. I am not prepared to authorise an, order, examination, the of the opposition. an examination of 27,000 files in order to provide answers to what is clearly a fishing expedition on the part of the opposition. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the member for Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is addressed to the minister representing the special minister of state. And is the minister aware of continuing allegations, including new allegations yesterday afternoon? and today by the disgraced member for Reid of improper political Order. donations. Order. The member for Dixon will resume his seat. <laughs> the member for Dixon will start his question again without that reference to the member for Reid. Order. Yeah. Member for Dixon will withdraw that insinuation and, and restate his question. Yes, I withdraw that, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is, uh, as I say to the, member, uh, sorry, to the uh, minister representing the Special Minister of State, 
And is the minister aware of continuing allegations, including new allegations yesterday afternoon and today by the member for Reid, of improper political donations by Mr Karim Kizawani? What is the government's response to these allegations, and does the minister have any additional information regarding this matter? Good question. The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Leader of the House, representing the Special Minister of State. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker I am aware of continuing allegations uh, against Mr Karim The member Kurswani. for Braden is warned. Uh, Mr Kurswani uh, was a uh, long-time friend of the member for Reid and a long-time donor uh, to the member for Reid's conference. Uh, Mr Speaker, yesterday uh, I quoted a letter from the member for Reid uh, to Mr Kurswani acknowledging a $300 donation in 2001. Uh, last night, uh, last night uh, the member for Reid uh, admitted a similar donation in 1999. I have here, Mr Speaker, a, uh, a letter on parliamentary uh, a letterhead uh, of 25th of September 1998 addressed uh, Dear Karim. Well, <laughs> Dear Karim, I write to thank you very much for your very generous donation of $250 to my campaign. The letter goes on. The letter goes on. The letter goes on. Your support and close association with my office. Your support and close association with my office is very valuable to me, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Kiswani has also Member been involved. For Fowler. He's also been involved. Uh, He's been conscripted by uh, the member for Reid uh, in the member for Reid's branch stacking activities. Now, Mr. Speaker, it turned out that Mr. El Durrani uh, wasn't just a single branch stacker, but he was part of a group of 20 branch stackers uh, brought along, uh, brought along uh, to a meeting uh, to help uh, uh, David Borger. Uh, I... Minister, resume his seat. Member for Werra. Manager of Opposition Business on a point Mr. of order. Mr. Speaker, this is repetition of the false allegation. <laughs> repetition of the false allegation made against the member for Reid that the member for Reid corrected on the parliamentary record in his personal explanation and in another speech yesterday. I refer you, Mr. Speaker, to your ruling on the 12th of December last year, where you said, and I quote, that every member's word should be taken as their bond. I have never had reason to regret that comment. I do not think that matters of misrepresentation should continue. Yes, right. You were right then, Mr Speaker, and I ask you to call the minister to order and prevent him from continuing with these misrepresentations. Yeah, yeah. The minister has the call. I have heard the minister's comments. I do not, uh, as I commented to the member for Werra yesterday, the chair is in this difficult position between in no way restricting the opportunity for free speech and at the same time expecting members only to comment on things that they believe can be totally um, defended, accounted for. The minister has the call. I'm listening closely to his reply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm quoting now uh, from a question that was put to uh, Mr Eldorani uh, by the Age newspaper. I asked if it was Mr Kurswani, Mr Ferguson and Mr, Bo or, or, and Mr Borger who paid the memberships, uh, uh, and I'm quoting uh, uh, Mr Eldorani, he said one of them. He said one of them. He said one of them. Well, and, and, now, and, now, of course, and now, of course, the member for Reid is trying to smear Mr Eldorani uh, by, by suggesting that in some way what he said was tainted. Well, Mr Speaker, let's look at the quality. Let's look, let's look at the quality uh, of the statements made uh, by the member for Reid. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr, Mr, uh, the member for Reid uh, told the parliament uh, in a personal explanation uh, the day before yesterday, Mr Eldorani resides in the Prime Minister's electorate, not Parramatta. Well, Mr Speaker, that's correct at the moment, but in 1999, when he joined the ALP, Mr Eldorani was enrolled in Parramatta. He was on the electoral roll in Parramatta. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker um, the member for Reid said in his personal explanation uh, he, that is to say Mr Eldorani, continues to hold head office membership, entitling him to no voting rights whatsoever in ALP pre-selections. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I have here a copy uh, of Mr Eldorani's membership application uh, stamped by the head office of the Australian Labor Party in Sussex Street stating uh, that Mr Eldorani is in the Parramatta 
the Parramatta SEC. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I believe Mr. Eldorani, contrary to the statement of this parliament by the member for Reid, I believe that Mr. Eldorani is in the Oatlands branch in the Parramatta area. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, further, further, Mr. Speaker, further, Mr. Speaker. Further, Mr. Speaker um, the member for Reid said, and I quote to this parliament, this, the reality is that this person has paid membership fees from his credit card for a number of years. That's what he told the parliament. Well, Mr Speaker, I have this membership application. There is no record of any credit card payment, Mr Speaker. No, red, no record of any credit Minister. card payment, Mr Speaker. So what Minister. is necessary, Mr Speaker? Minister, resume his seat. Member for Reid. Treasurer. Member for Wera, uh, Manager of uh, Mr Speaker, in your earlier ruling you said that uh, a minister making claims similar to those of the Minister for Workplace Relations needs to be able to verify the claims that he's making. Uh, he, has now, he has now said he has now said there is no record of credit card payment. Well, obviously the record is held at the Australian Labor Party head member office. Member for Wera resume his seat. Yeah, member for Wera resume his seat. I have been listening closely to the minister. The minister is in order. The minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the point is, who paid Mr. Eldorani's membership fees? Who paid his joining fees? I have the application to join, uh, and there is no credit card payment. And the question is, Mr. Speaker, just who did? Pay for this particular stacker uh, to join the Australian Labor Party, and Mr. Speaker, I table the document uh, so that the member for Reid uh, can study it more closely. But, Mr. Speaker, there is an issue here uh, for the leader of the opposition. Uh, what we've seen over the last few days is the member for Reid, this parliamentary uh, PC clod, uh, this uh, this uh, Inspector Clouseau uh, of forensic analysis. He's completely derailed the Labor Party's attack on the Minister for Immigration. He's burnt off the Lebanese Jack, community. The Minister, resume his seat. The member of Wera, it's Point of order. Standing order 145, Mr the Speaker. The Minister is going well beyond the bounds of the question that was asked. There was no mention no. in the question about no. the Leader of the Opposition, which invites no, these comments. member of Wera, resume his seat. Standing Order 145 refer refers to relevance, and the question I have to admit is I jotted it down was a frightfully broad question. The Minister has the call. Not, not, a, not only that, Mr Speaker, but what the member for Reid has ended up doing is drawing attention yet again to Labor branch stacking activities in Western Sydney, activities that the Leader of the Opposition says must cease. But, Mr Speaker, what could we, what could we expect? What could we expect uh, from, uh, from the member for Reid? Because let's face it, Mr Speaker, as the member for Werriwa has said, admittedly in a different context, Laurie Ferguson has again demonstrated why he is one of the great embarrassments. A shambling mess. The only reason he is in Parliament is his father had the numbers in Granville. The only reason he is on the front bench is his brother had the numbers in the left. If the Fergusons were listed on the stock market, it would be under the trading name Nepotism Inc. Laurie's political ability was fully exposed during the last campaign. It is an embarrassment, an embarrassment to the Labor movement to think of him as a future minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is now contemplating, contemplating a reshuffle. I put it to the Leader of the Opposition that he must drop uh, the member minister, for Reid from his front bench. First minister, of all, for incompetence, but secondly, for misleading minister the parliament. Minister, resume his seat. May Order. <laughs> member for where of manager of opposition. Is that the minister table all the documents from which he was uh, reading and referring? And I remind you, Mr. Speaker, of your ruling that the minister needs to be able to verify all these. Uh, Repeated false accusations, and uh, accordingly, he should Member table all the documents. Seat. Order. I do not. My first question to the to the minister is: Was he quoting from documents? Were the documents confidential? Let me, deal with the other, let me deal with the other point of order raised by the member for Werriwa. 
At no stage have I or any occupier of the chair demanded verification. What I have indicated is that where a personal explanation has been given, it should be taken at face value. And I've attempted fairly to implement that on both sides. The bind the chair faces is, as everyone appreciates, the need not to restrict the opportunity for free speech while obliging members to do only what they make only what they believe are justifiable comments. The member for Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations in his capacity as Minister representing the Special Minister of State on concerns regarding an organisation registered under the Commonwealth Electoral Act. Is the Minister aware of the attendance of Mr. Dante Tan and another director of Universal Line Share Proprietary Limited at a breakfast fundraiser for the member for Parramatta at the Pacific International Hotel Parramatta? on 19 October 2001 during the election campaign which was addressed by, Pete, my, by Minister Reith, Peter Reith, in his capacity as a Minister of the Government at that time. Can the Minister confirm that principals of this company made cash contributions of over $1,500 in auctions and raffles for the Parramatta Liberal so campaign. Them, Minister, have all these contributions been disclosed in accordance with the Commonwealth Electoral Act or is this an attempt to launder a cash donation to the Liberal Party? The Minister for Employment and Workplace. Minister for Regional Services, Territories and Local Government. The Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations, Leader of the House, representing the Special Minister of State. Well, Mr. Speaker, if uh, the member for Lawler wants to know about money laundering, I, su I suggest she talks to uh, Senator Balkus, but Mr. Speaker, and his flatmate. That's right. Yeah, that's, the minister, laundry runs a laundry minister, mat, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, look, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm not aware. I'm not aware of the matters in question. But Mr. Speaker, if the member for Lawler, if the member for Lawler has any evidence, as opposed to innuendo, make it available to the AEC. Make it available to the AEC, and we will investigate. Honourable Member for Farrah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. I refer to the the Global Illicit Drug Trends report released earlier today by the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. What is the Prime Minister's response to the report's findings concerning illicit drugs in Australia? Prime Minister. Um, I thank um, uh, the uh, member for Farrah for her question and compliment her on her continuing interest in support uh, for the government's Tough on Drugs campaign. Today, Mr Speaker, as many members will know, has been declared the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. And the 2003 Global Illicit Drug Trends Report, released overnight by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, has some very interesting things to say about these matters within Australia. That report no, confirms anyway. that in relation to Australia, law enforcement efforts have been very successful in dismantling heroin trafficking, that more treatment services are available to help those with the drug problem. And that there has been a significant decrease, Mr. Speaker, and this is the most important finding of all, Mr. Speaker, that there has been a significant decrease in the use of heroin in Australia, and as a result, the number of heroin overdose deaths has fallen significantly, Mr. Speaker. The report properly goes on to say that a vigilance against any regression in these areas is needed, but I think it is a matter of. Member for of, of significant achievement, Mr. Speaker, that this report confirms that the objectives of the government's tough on drugs campaign are steadily being realised, Mr. Speaker. Contrary to the doomsayers, Mr. Speaker, we are making progress, albeit slow progress, but nonetheless progress, in the long and hard fight against the terrible scourge of illicit drug abuse in this country. When we introduced the Tough on Drugs campaign in 1998, we had three objectives. We wanted to strengthen law enforcement, 
We wanted to educate young people against starting drug use in the first place, and we wanted to provide alternative treatment for people who wanted to break the habit, Mr Speaker. And we've now invested close to a billion dollars in this campaign. And what this report demonstrates is that despite the people who said that a zero-tolerance approach wouldn't work, that approach is working, Mr Speaker. It is making inroads. It is reducing the number of people who die from heroin overdoses, Mr Speaker. It is resulting in people getting better treatment. And it is resulting in record seizures of heroin. And for those who care about the future of young people in this country, there is no more important fight than the fight against the scourge of drugs, Mr. Speaker. And this government will continue, will continue uh, the policy that has followed over the last seven years. It will continue to invest resources in fighting the drug czars. It will continue to provide alternative treatment. It will continue to work with state governments. And I thank them, Mr. Speaker, for their cooperation in relation to diversion program, and it will continue to educate the young based on the philosophy of zero tolerance and encouraging people not to commence drug use in the first place, because we still have significant challenges. There is an unwelcome rise in the use of amphetamines, Mr Speaker, and ecstasy, and although the use of cannabis has declined, its usage is still far too high. And let me, on the subject of cannabis, congratulate the New South Wales government for having started a radio campaign warning young people about the deleterious effects of cannabis use. There used to be a, a stupid notion around in this country that you could, take, you could use cannabis with no damage, with no potential Ill, use in the years, uh, Ill effects in the years ahead. That has now been conclusively disproved. It is not only a massive contributor to depression and suicide, it is also uh, a drug which used will lead to the use of harder drugs, Mr. Speaker. I want to. Uh, this is the last um, question time of this sitting, Mr. Speaker, and I can't think of a more important social note on which to end this, but to redeclare and reconfirm the absolute determination of this government to continue quite unconditionally its tough on drugs campaign. Yeah. Yeah. for Lawler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. And I refer to his answer yesterday that he would not investigate allegations of whether Mr Karim Kizawani accepted fees from Mr Dante Tan in return for using his influence to stop the cancellation of Mr Dante Tan's visa. Is the Minister aware of allegations that Mr Dante Tan paid Mr Karim Kizawani $220,000 in exchange for Mr Kizawani using his influence to stop the cancellation of Mr Dante Tan's visa. Will the minister now investigate this matter? The Minister for Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr Speaker, in relation to the question asked by the member for Lula, the situation hasn't changed since yesterday. Um, if there are serious allegations for which the member has evidence, it should be put to the department's investigation section to be investigated, and I would expect you to do just that. Minister. Um, I don't think they're matters, Mr Speaker, that should be addressed to me. I am not responsible for investigating these matters. I would expect, I would expect that no, I won't. There is, I, no evidence has been given to me. No evidence has been Order. given to the me. If the member the has chair. evidence, it should be provided to the investigation section of my department Order. to be dealt with fully and properly, um, as I would expect it to be. Member for Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Workplace and Relations, representing the Special Minister of State. Has any new information come to light, Minister, yesterday and overnight about the Balkus raffle rort? And if so, what is the government's response? The Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations, Leader of the House, representing the Special Minister of State. Well, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank, uh, I thank the member for Gilmore for a question. And Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, overnight, Mr. Speaker, uh, Dante Tan's uh, business partner, Mr. John Hatchiti, uh, has now given uh, a uh, full account of the pair's uh, business relationship uh, with Senator Balkus. Uh, he said last night, uh, "My partner, Dante Tan." basically said he doesn't want it publicised, so can we contribute something 
uh, where we don't have to stand in the middle of George and Pitt Street, Sydney, and can it be done? And then, uh, and then Mr Nick Bolk has said you can buy raffle Member tickets. Member for Fraser. You can buy raffle tickets. Uh, the question of a big donation came about, and he said, that's to say Senator Bolk has said, he said, whoa, thank you very much. A cheque was handed over on the basis that it goes to raffles, and thank you very much. Uh, that was what uh, Mr Dante Tan's business partner said yesterday. He was asked, Member he was asked, for Jellybrand. He was asked, was Dante Tan interested in winning a prize? And Dante Tan's business partner said no, because the prize from the Labor Party, in my opinion, could have been a picture of Bob Hawke or a picture of Gough Gough Whitlam, a portrait of some sort. We don't want it. We don't want it. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, this raffle was a ruse. This raffle was nothing but a rort for laundering money uh, to Leader, the Australian Labor Minister, Party. Minister, resume his seat. Member Ware on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, the question very clearly asks for new information. This is exactly what the Minister said yesterday. He's not providing any new information. He's run out of any new information. Member he should Ware be brought to order. His seat. The Minister's answer is in order. I've noted the question. The Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, the other day Senator Bolka said that he was involved in major fundraising raffles uh, for the Hindmarsh campaign. Uh, yesterday, Mr Speaker, the South Australian State Secretary of the Australian Labor Party said that he couldn't recall any raffle. Uh, Senator Penny Wong, who was the Hindmarsh campaign director, said she couldn't recall any raffle. Uh, Steve Georgianis, who was the Hindmarsh candidate and a former Bulkers staffer, said that he couldn't recall any raffle. In fact, Mr Speaker, the only people who could recall any raffle at all was Senator Bulkers, who couldn't recall it when he filled out his uh, political disclosure, uh, and Dante Tan's business partner, who didn't want it to be a raffle. He just wanted to give $10,000 uh, to Senator Bulkers. Now, Mr Speaker, if Senator Bulkers had really written out 494 Four hundred and ninety-four twenty-dollar raffle services. tickets. Why couldn't why couldn't he remember that when he filled out uh, his disclosures, Mr. Speaker? And Mr. Speaker, if he had to fill out uh, if he'd had to fill out a revised uh, political disclosure, has he also had to fill out a revised a taxation return, Mr. Speaker? Because, Mr. Speaker, this is the ultimate phantom raffle. There was no prize. There was no ticket. And there was no winner except the Australian Labor Party. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I said yesterday that since this story broke, since this story broke, the Senator Bolkus uh, has been Australia's greatest fugitive after Dante Tan himself. Well, Mr. Speaker, I was wrong. I was wrong. Australia's greatest fugitive is actually is actually Senator Bolkus's flatmate, uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, Minister, who said. Minister, resume his seat. Mem Member for where on a point order. Where's Russ Cameron? Where's Members on my left are. De <laughs> Members on my left are denying the member for where with a call. Uh, member for Batman. Member for where a manager of opposition business. Mr. Speaker, on the question of relevance, the minister is not applying himself to the manager question of that was business. asked because deal it required with new order. information. <clears throat> I just, I'd remind the manager of opposition business that while the question bears some similarities, to, while the answer bears some similarities to one given yesterday, the standing orders do not in any way prohibit answers being similar. The minister's latter sentence, I had some difficulty in bearing relevance to the question asked. I asked him to come back to the question. I was, I was simply making the point that normally you can't turn the radio on without hearing the Leader of the Opposition carping and snarling well, Minister, about something. Minister, resume his seat. I cannot hear a further point of order when I have not as yet heard anything from the Minister and the member for where I may check the Hansard record that in any way reflects on any decision I have made. I am listening closely to what the Minister said. He has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, it is important uh, that uh, we get to the bottom uh, of the great raffle rort. Uh, it is important, uh, it is important uh, that not just Senator Bolkus 
uh, come out of protective custody, uh, but, uh, but, that the, but that the Leader of the Opposition uh, let himself out of house arrest and come clean about Labor's money laundering scandal. Mr Speaker, uh, I, looked up the, I, looked up the, I looked up the dictionary today, Mr Speaker, um, for the collective noun uh, for roosters, Mr. Speaker, for turkeys, in fact, it was the collective noun for turkeys yeah. is a raffle of turkeys. Minister, Mr. Resume Speaker. His seat. Minister, resume his seat. Minister will resume his seat. Order. I'll recognise you in just a moment. I have a question to the minister. I presume he has concluded his answer. The member for Werriwa, the member for Werriwa was seeking a point of order when I asked him to resume his seat. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. My point of order was that the minister is consistently defying your rule and uh, surely should be disciplined under the standing order. Member for Werriwa will resume his seat. I intervened, as the member for Wera is aware, and no other comments made, desirable or undesirable, were outside the standing orders. Member for Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General, and it follows my last question to the Minister for Immigration. Given that an individual is prepared to make a statement to the federal police in relation to an allegation that Mr Dante Tan paid Mr Karim Kizawani $220,000 in exchange for Mr Kizawani using his influence to stop the cancellation of Mr Dante Tan's visa, will the Attorney-General refer this matter to the Australian Federal Police for investigation? The Attorney-General. Well, Mr Speaker, I think the uh the intervention of the Attorney General is entirely unnecessary. If a person has a statement to make and a complaint to make alleging a breach of Commonwealth law, they can make it directly to the Australian Federal Police. And that's what should happen. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the minister inform the House how the defeat of Saddam Hussein has changed the lives of the Iraqi people? Would the minister provide practical examples of these changes? Member for Charlton. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Member for Swan. Um, Mr Speaker, first can I thank the Honourable Member for Curtin for her question. And, uh, I know she is one of uh, all of the members on this side of the House who are delighted with the role this government played in overthrowing the barbarous regime of yeah, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, the demise of Saddam Hussein's regime was not just a military victory for the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, but it was a momentous victory for the people of Iraq people who will no longer be subjected to state-run torture, to rape, to detention without trial, to summary execution and other grotesque human rights violations. Mr Speaker, during Saddam Hussein's rule there was only one political party, the Ba'ath Party, and the membership of other political parties was punishable by death. Mr Speaker, political parties in Iraq have now multiplied with many new groupings, such as the National Democratic Movement, the Independent Democratic Movement and the Constitutional Monarchists even, emerging since the downfall of the regime. And Mr Speaker, Saddam's regime systematically killed senior Shia clerics, it desecrated holy sites, it interfered with religious education and it prevented Shia adherents from performing their religious rights. Mr Speaker, the Shia are now free for to practice their religion, illustrated by the celebrations in April of the first Ashura pilgrimage for several decades, an event which of course previously had been banned by the regime of Saddam Hussein. Uh, Mr Speaker, in Saddam's day, the media in Iraq was very tightly controlled. 
Today, there is unlimited access in Iraq to foreign satellite broadcasts, and about 90 newspapers are operating freely. Economic freedom for Iraqis has been facilitated by the, by the transition from a centrally planned economy to the liberal market system. Of course, there has been uh, the lifting of sanctions against Iraq, which in itself is enormously beneficial. Also, uh, the House may be interested to know that uh, tariffs have been removed on imports, a dispensation that will remain in place until the 31st of December. And that's expected to increase, it obviously will increase, the availability of consumer items, and obviously it will make that, those uh, items available uh, at cheaper prices than would otherwise be the case. Mr Speaker, Member services in Cornwall. Iraq are, already, are also improving. Um, the honourable member um, would probably no doubt be aware that in Iraq um, electricity is now more available to more Iraqis than was the case before the war started earlier this year. So, Mr Speaker, uh, having said all this, despite the greater uh, political, religious and economic freedoms, we have no illusions about the challenges that lie ahead in Iraq. They're obviously very substantial, and there are still sympathisers of the former Ba'athist uh, dictatorship who are determined to attack coalition forces and also are, um, Iraqis themselves. And I can only say, Mr Speaker, that uh, um, from our side of the House, um, the government, we very warmly welcome the growing international role in helping with the rehabilitation of Iraq. This week, over 50 countries committed themselves to holding a major donor conference in Iraq in October of this year. And, Mr Speaker, it's an important statistic, this, but some 40 countries 40 countries are expected to send troops to support the coalition-led stabilisation force in Iraq. Um, so, Mr Speaker, the transition from the simply barbaric dictatorship of Saddam Hussein to a more liberal uh, Iraq is, of course, not just something that we on this side of the House welcome, but it's something that, in particular and most importantly, is so well, warmly welcomed by the people of Iraq. And I say again what I said yesterday, Mr Speaker, never will our pride diminish in the role we play in liberating the people of Iraq. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would Order. prevent the member for Lawler from moving the following motion forthwith, that this House censure the Howard Government and the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs for one, failing to investigate the allegation that Mr Dante Tan paid Mr Karim Kizawani the sum of $220,000 in exchange for Mr Kizawani using his influence to stop the cancellation of Mr Dante Tan's visa. Two, failing to properly explain the awarding of permanent residency and citizenship to Dante Tan, the Philippines' most wanted corporate fugitive, following a donation, a disclosed donation, of $10,000 to the Liberal Party from Mr Dante Tan. Three, failing to properly explain the inappropriate and recurring involvement of Mr Karim Kizawani in a large number of migration cases where applicants have sought ministerial intervention in the awarding of a visa, and most especially that of Mr Dante Tan and Mr Bedwini Habish, and for continuing to undermine the integrity and honesty of Australia's migration system via his awarding of visas following donations to the Liberal Party. Uh, the me me Prime Minister has indicated that the suspension can, will proceed. The me member for Lawler has the call. Right. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say that during the course of the last three weeks, as the cash for visas scandal has unfolded, this House has heard of the Lebanese friends of Mr Ruddock. What now stands revealed is that Minister Ruddock is the president of the Australian friends of Mr Karim Kizawani and Mr Dante Tan was vice president of the very same organisation. One can only assume that one of the reasons Mr Dante Tan, this Christopher Scase-style figure, fled the country is so he can travel the world setting up international branches of the, of the Karim Kizawani Friendship Group. No doubt that's why the government sat idly by and let Dante Tan flee the country. There may have 
There may have been a chase for Scase, but no one in the Howard government wanted to be part of the plan to catch Tan. Mr Speaker, the Minister for Immigration deserves censure for the cash for visas scandal. The scandal is a complex one, but the key to understanding it is to understand the roles played by Minister Ruddock and Mr Karim Kizawani. Mr Kizawani is the key which unlocks the door to this scandal. Mr Kizawani is a personal friend of the Minister for Immigration going back over a number of decades. They dine together. They are frequently in each other's company. Mr Kizawani is able to ring members of the minister's staff. Mr Kizawani is able to ring members of the minister's department and have them record on file that that intervention has been made. He is a peddler of influence, a Mr Fixit. Go and see Mr Kizawani and he fixes up a visa for you. And now we have an allegation that Mr Kizawani received $220,000 from Mr Dante Tan, the Philippines' most wanted corporate fugitive, in order for him to use his influence with this minister to get that matter resolved. We have an allegation of $220,000 changing hands, and as I understand it from question time, this government most certainly doesn't want to investigate it. And as I understand it, they're not even sure they want to debate it as we are here today. So we are asking the Minister for Immigration to come forward and explain the nature of his relationship with Mr Kizawani, the number of matters Mr Kizawani has involved in, whether he's ever had any information before him that Mr Kizawani has charged for his immigration services in breach of the law and what is known about this allegation of $220,000. What we do know is day after day in this House we have asked this minister to detail how many times Mr Kizawani has approached him about immigration matters and question after question, day after day, that stands unanswered. Right. And it's not that the system's not capable of generating figures. When the minister wants it to generate figures about East Timorese, it does. When the minister wants it to generate figures about the number of second interventions, it does. When the minister thinks he's on a good case against the member for Reid, it somehow spews out figures remarkably. The only figure we can't get from the system is the figure that is key to this scandal, which is how many times has Mr Karim Kizawani been involved? And I suspect, I suspect the reason the minister doesn't want to do that is even formally on the file, in the form of letters, there will be many, many, many interventions. Just run the word Just, yeah, many interventions, hundreds, I would suggest. He doesn't want to do that search because he knows that the number will be high. But I'll also make, uh, make this point. I believe another reason that the minister doesn't want to do it is he knows that many of the matters that have come to his attention from Mr Kizawani have come to his attention in circumstances where there wouldn't be a letter or there wouldn't be a file note, because there's been a private discussion which has ensured that that file has got in front of the minister. That, I think, is the reason that the minister is stonewalling on answering how many times Mr Karim Kizawani has been involved in immigration matters. If I'm wrong about that, then during the course of this afternoon, the minister can tell us that figure, because it simply defies belief to say the system can't produce that figure when it has produced so many other figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's just turn to, let's turn to the question of Dante Tan. Mr Kizawani. His role in the Dante Tan matter. Well, there's an allegation now about $220,000, but there is so much else unexplained about the Dante Tan matter. This is a man that comes to this country to build a business. The minister asserts a business was built. He asserts that on the departmental file there's a business monitoring survey, and he asserted on television, but never in this house, that there are bills of lading attached to that. What he hasn't asserted, and what I don't think he'll ever assert, is that there actually was a business. Mm. I think there might have been a load of documents, but there actually wasn't yeah. a business. So the Philippines, the, business. the Philippines' biggest corporate crook comes to Australia engages in a bit of document manipulation and there's never an independent check as to whether or not there was a business. But we do know, we do know that there was a donation to the Liberal Party, actually disclosed donation to the Liberal Party, and there's an allegation about a major payment to Dante Tan. Now, in this House during the course of this week, 
The minister has said, as he's stonewalled on these matters, as he's refused to actually answer the question how many times he's dealt with Mr Karim Kizawani on immigration matters, he said, and I quote, I stand by the decisions I made. Well, good result, minister. Good result. Dante Tan in Australia, permanent visa, expedited citizenship, and then flees the country. Good, good result. Good decision to stand by. Got that 100 per cent right, didn't we? This is the man who holds himself out as the architect of the integrity of the immigration system, and here he is standing by a result where a corporate fugitive got into this country. He's on the local warning list in the Philippines Embassy. Warning, warning, warning. This is a bad person. But despite that, following a donation to the Liberal Party and following a course of dealing with Mr Karim Kizawani, potentially involving $220,000, this man gets permanent residency and he gets expedited access to Australian citizenship. And if people in and if people in this house, if people in this house on that side don't think that requires explanation, well, I really don't well, know what they would yourself. say requires explanation. And there's lots of waving of hands Normal here, but practice. that is that is what has happened. And I believe that the, the two ministers, ceremony? that the minister for citizenship as well, knows it. Mr. Karim, Mr. Karim Kizawani, clearly the key to these matters. And what we also know, what we also know, of course, is that Mr Kizawani isn't just in the Dante Tan matter. He isn't just rubbing shoulders with the biggest corporate crook from the Philippines. He's absolutely key to the Habish matter, which we've raised in this place, which still remains largely unexplained. There's never been an explanation as to how the file got to the minister on the third occasion. He's dealt with it twice. On the second occasion, they say, "Don't show this to me anymore. Don't show this to me anymore." Well, what got it back up to you again, Minister? The only possible explanation for that is that you asked for it, or a member of your staff asked for it, and then you determined to make a decision on information which was available on the file six years earlier—an unexplained matter. So this short opportunity, there's a lot more to go through, but this short opportunity uh, is my opportunity to say to this minister, you've got an option now to explain your relationship with Karim Kizawani. He's the key to this scandal. Your relationship with him is the key to this scandal. There's an allegation about $220,000 changing hands. He's at the centre of the Dante Tan matter. He's at the centre of the Bed Bedwini Habish matter. Karim Kizawani, with Minister Ruddick, is at the centre of the cash for visas scandal, much of which, after four weeks of parliamentary questioning, remains Order. unexplained and should be explained now. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? Mr Speaker, I second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Um, uh, what, what a, what a member for where on a point of order? Mr Speaker, uh, ten minutes ago, when the member for Lawler moved her suspension motion to facilitate a censure in the House, the Prime Minister said, I accept it. The Prime Minister said, I accept it. Well, well Mr. Order, Speaker, order, Mr. Order, Speaker, order, please. Mr. The member for Werriwa has the call. I do not know why he would need any help from anyone behind him. The manager of opposition business. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the House has just said, we'll take the suspension. This makes the point perfectly. The member for Lawler has the right to move the suspension, irrespective of what the government thinks. There's no right to accept or refuse it. The Prime Minister, having said, I accept it, the only thing he can possibly accept is the censure motion, which should now proceed before the House. And let me indicate that, from the Chair's perspective, all that has happened to date is entirely according to Hoyle, or the, or the standing orders, which may be even better if you reflect <laughs> on it. And that is, the member for Lawler has moved to suspend standing orders and the time allocated for her to do so is, is as is normally the case. The member for Reid has indicated that he wanted to second it, and I now um, recognise the Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, I think it's high time that members opposite finally realise that on this matter they are flogging a dead horse. They are flogging a dead horse. It's, it's, it's high time. It's Order. high time. It's high Order. time. The same courtesy is not expected Mr. to be extended Speaker, to the member members Lawler, opposite, will be extended to the Leader of the House. Understand I will take uh, that this pursuit of the Minister member for Immigration Pariah. has completely blown up in their faces. It's completely blown up in their Minister faces because of the incompetence of the, of the member for Reid, because of the venality of Senator Balkus, 
and because of the honesty of the Minister for Immigration. The Minister for Immigration is an honest man who has been unjustly maligned day in, day out in this place by members of the opposition who have no evidence Member whatsoever for, for their repeated smear. There is innuendo, there is smear, there is traducing of reputations, but the one thing they don't have is any hard evidence whatsoever. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there was actually a new smear today. There was a new smear today. Uh, there was the allegation uh, that Mr. Dante Tan uh, had paid $220,000 uh, to Mr. Karim Kiswani. Now, Mr. Speaker, if this was anything other than scuttlebutt, if this was anything other than fourth or fifth hand rumour, they would have dwelt on that matter today because it was at least, it was at least new. Uh, it was a, a new factoid, if you like. It was new pseudo information. But, Mr. Speaker, the fact that they didn't dwell on the on the so-called $220,000 business relationship, the fact that they didn't focus on that, demonstrates that they the do not the have any hard evidence whatsoever. No hard evidence whatsoever. Just endless smear, uh, endless innuendo, endless traducing of the reputation of a good man and a fine minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, but let me just let me just let me just uh, pose this question, Mr. Speaker. Why shouldn't um, uh, Karim Kiswani uh, and Mr. Dante Ton uh, have? A business relationship with one another, because let's Order, face it. Because let's face call. it. Oh yes, but but we're talking about a business relationship here. We're not talking about offering Minister. immigration advice. But Mr. Speaker, why? What's so bad? Uh, what's so bad uh, about uh, uh, Dante Tan and Karim Kiswani having a business relationship with one another when Dante Tan had a business relationship with Senator Bolkus? Dante Tan had a business relationship with Senator Bolkus. Dante Tan and Senator Bolkus investigated business deals together. And if it's all right for Senator Bolkus, why isn't it all right for Dante Tan to have a business relationship with Karim Kisawani? Now, Mr. Speaker, in the end, uh, uh, what this uh, series of allegations boils down to is the claim that there is something wrong with the Minister for Immigration being friends with Mr Karim Kiswani. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr Karim Kiswani is a distinguished member of the Lebanese community. And why is it that members opposite, day in, day out, are coming in here uh, and smearing the Lebanese community? Uh, why are they uh, making them uh, guilty by association? But, Mr Speaker, there is nothing whatsoever wrong. There is nothing whatsoever wrong with the Minister for Immigration, with the Minister for Immigration uh, having a friendship uh, with Karim Kiswani. Karim Kiswani is a decent, uh, upstanding Australian citizen. He's been granted the Order of Australia Medal uh, by the Order of Australia Order. Council. And, Mr. Speaker, not only Member has he been Blackland. a good friend of the Minister for Immigration over the years, but over the years, as we now know only too well, uh, he's been a good friend of the Member for Reid, a friendship which, of course, the Member for Reid was only too happy to burn in his insane pursuit uh, of the Minister for Immigration. Not only has he been a friend of the Minister for Immigration, he's been a good friend of Mr Eddie O'Bade. I suspect half the Labor members of Western Sydney over the years uh, have been good friends of Mr Karim Kiswani. And if it's good enough for the Labor Party, it ought to be good enough for everyone. Why can't uh, the Minister for Immigration uh, have a good friendship with Mr Karim Kiswani. Well, Mr. Speaker, the other allegation. Member for Law, the other allegation, to be heard in the, other the other allegation uh, is that uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, some kind of improper influence exerted uh, just because, just because uh, Mr. Karim Kiswani, uh, at different times, has made representations as a friend uh, on behalf of members of the Lebanese community. Well, Mr Speaker, we have come to a sorry pass in a democracy. We have come to a sorry pass in a democracy when one Australian citizen is not allowed to approach a member of parliament or a minister in a government on behalf of a friend. Is that what they're really saying? Is that what they're really saying that there's something wrong? Uh, with a decent, upstanding Australian citizen approaching a minister and a government and saying, uh, can you do something? Of course, Mr Speaker, this is an absurd allegation, an absolutely absurd minister. allegation. And, Mr Speaker, 
not only, not only does it uh, do no credit whatsoever uh, to Macmillan members of is warned. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, the repeated allegation of something as absurd as this just brings the parliament uh, into disrepute. Mr. Speaker, uh, let me make it uh, very clear uh, that there is nothing wrong uh, with citizens making uh, donations, nothing wrong whatsoever with citizens uh, making Fraser. donations. It only becomes a problem, Mr. Speaker, when those donations are not properly disclosed under the Australian Electoral Act. And, Mr. Speaker, if there is one clear fact that has emerged from the debate, uh, or at least uh, the smear which has come from members opposite over the last three weeks of parliamentary sitting, if there is one clear fact that has emerged, it is that the one, the one donation that has been improperly disclosed, in fact not disclosed at all, was the infamous $10,000 donation by Dante Tan uh, to Senator Balkus, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, Member there is Lawler. nothing wrong with making representations on behalf of Australian citizens. Nothing wrong whatsoever. Uh, sure, sure, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is wrong uh, to exercise improper influence, but at no stage, at no stage whatsoever, has there been any hard evidence. No hard evidence. Not a shred. Not a skerrick. Not a tittle of hard evidence has been adduced by members opposite to justify their repeated accusations and allegations uh, against the Minister for Immigration. In the end, it boils down to this. Uh, there was a decision uh, and there was a donation, or there was a donation and there was a decision. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, uh, the, member, the member for Lawler, uh, in uh, her initial uh, uh, censure speech on this uh, subject, said, well, uh, he made a decision uh, and then there was a donation, uh, therefore there is some kind of uh, improper uh, influence brought to bear. Uh, she also liked to quote uh, uh, Virgil at us uh, in that speech. Well, let me quote a bit of Latin back to her. Uh, what she's saying is post hoc ergo propter hoc. I'm sure the Latin scholars on this, on this side would know what her argument is. After this, therefore, on account of this, well, Mr Speaker, what she's got to demonstrate is the propter. Uh, and there is no propter, Mr. Speaker. There is no on account of that members opposite have been able to demonstrate. Mr. Speaker, you know what? You know Leader what? You know what? You know what the uh, the Minister Member for Immigration's Burke. real offence is. You know what the Minister for Immigration's uh, uh, real crime is uh, in the eyes of members opposite. He's a good minister. He's a good minister. He is a very, very good minister. For the first time in years. Uh, the administration of Australia's immigration policy is on a sound footing. Uh, for the first time in years, the whole of the Australian community is united the the behind our immigration resist. policy because they know that for the first time in years uh, there is a clean minister running a straight policy, a policy which is in the national interest of this country. Uh, that is the Minister for Immigration's great achievement. Uh, that is uh, why he is so widely respected by the Australian community, and that is why uh, members opposite will do anything. They will traduce anyone. They will blag out any reputation. They will burn any friendship in order to drag this minister down. Well, Mr. Speaker, they haven't succeeded. They haven't succeeded at all. The Minister for Immigration has emerged from three weeks of blackguarding with his reputation sound, standing tall, respected by the Australian people. The only people who have emerged uh, with their reputations shattered by this are the member for Lawler, the member for Reid, uh, and, the, and the puppet master there, the leader of the opposition, the flatmate in chief. The member for Reid and seconding the motion. Where's Ruddick? Mr. Speaker, so. uh, if we question wanted is, any the question is standing orders be suspended. The member for Reid. Mr. Speaker, if we want any confirmation about the intimate relationship between the Liberal Party, its fundraising, and Mr. Dante Tan, we've had it today and yesterday in the operations of the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, in close collusion with Mr. Dante Tan's solicitors, CK Partners the people who, through whom Mr Kizawani channels some of these immigration cases. He has, uh, the, the, the person who is intimately, intimately connected with this whole case, Mr Walid and Mr Albert Kalush, have been in contact with the minister persistently to try and drag the question of multi, multi, uh, 
multifaceted immigration cheating by, it, with some kind of wild, preposterous claim that the, that the Labor Party left is branch stacking with friends of the minister. That is a reality that everything in the last day produced by this minister has come directly from the employees of Dan Tan, the person who is the, in the centre of this whole immigration case. And this relationship is not new. If we look at the Liberal Party and the way they are socialising constantly with Mr Dan Tan over the last two years, it's very interesting. We had the Minister of Immigration. He's only met him socially two or three times. He can't recall where. He doesn't know the venue. He doesn't Member, know if it's fundraising, but he's sure it was not at, at Romeo's restaurant. However, Mr Karim Kizawani, his close friend and business partner with Mr Ten, he says the minister met Mr, Mr. Tan at that, at that event. And then we have the member for Parramatta. He's in a whole series of other social events with, with, with Mr Dante Tan, the fugitive who faces 147 years in jail, the fugitive whose personal citizenship he walked away from his electoral office to be personally there for the conferral. He, in contrast, this minister, he's been to a whole lot of other separate events. Uh, we know from him that he's on a harbour cruise, a fundraiser, oh, yeah, where none. Mr. Tan, the multi-millionaire, he was on the fundraising cruise, but they didn't get any money out of him. He was he was such a good bloke, such a good friend of Mr. Abbott Member for and Mr. Cameron, that uh, he was just brought along for company. How preposterous! Now that's that's another yeah, event where we see the Liberal Party out there socialising with this escapee, this fugitive. And of course we on that and uh, we also had reference from the member Parramatta that he socialised at him at the Melbourne Cup event. Uh, we have a situation now today in regards to the Pacific, Pacific International Hotel at Parramatta, an event uh, where Mr Reith was the guest speaker. Once again, Mr Tan and Mr and the line share operation are there present. And they gave donations well in excess of fifteen hundred dollars. We can assure that we can assure the Minister of Employment and Workplace Relations. Order. They, they gave those donations, and uh, there's a few other fundraisers of the Parramatta campaign where these individuals were present. So what we got, what we have here today, the minister says it's all right for people to make representation. There's nothing criminal about an individual coming to a minister. The person involved in this is a person who has been a consistent attendee at functions. A person who has made a donation to, to the political party. Member for a Reed person, has the call. A person. Member for Lindsay. A person who, whilst he has the right to establish a business with any individual in this country, it seems just slightly too big a coincidence to me yeah. that the person that he formed this partnership with, the person he formed this minister partnership for citizenship. with, was a close confidant of the minister. A person who has such audacity, such effrontery, that he's been ringing up the department saying, "I'm ringing on behalf of the minister." That's the kind of entree he's had in this department. That's the person that Dante Tan decided it would be good to go into business with. That's the person who obviously put in a lot of heavy work in regards to this case. Now the reality is that I'll ask this the member person. Member to wind up his remarks. Sorry. No, to indicate the member Reed that the time uh, for the debate. And uh, quite I'll frankly, I wind the, up the, his the, remarks. I, the support for this man is unending. We have the member for Parramatta out there the other week saying, right now he's still saying this after the Filipino authorities. At, uh, Exposes. I'd say he was a fairly upfront, and I found him to be quite an honest person, Mr. Tan. How preposterous! The question is that the motion to suspend standing order. There are some people who even occupy the chair and don't know a great deal about the standing orders and the allocation of time. Clearly, the question is that the standing orders, that the motion to suspend standing orders, be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells.
I'm sorry, I, was, I suppose it could have gone up there, I suppose not. Okay. Lock the doors. The question is that the standing orders be suspended. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for <coughs> Melbourne Ports and Franklin tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Corangamite and Mallee tell us for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 64, no 79. The question is therefore negative. Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? Prime Minister. Should be placed on the notice paper. Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Well, I'll see you in Rafa Gate.